All right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Emmanuel Baptist Dinner Theater uh, that we have on occasion. Uh, some of you that are visiting, I had to tell my, my mom this. She said, do you do this every Sunday? Doesn't it get a, lot of, a little expensive after a while? Uh, and the answer is no, we don't do this every Sunday. Uh, but this is a special occasion. Uh, and it just, uh, I, I just want to say a shout out to the people who decorated the tables. Don't they look nice this morning? Uh, so thank you for the hard work. Uh, there, there are people that have been at work hard to make this weekend come off all together with our celebration yesterday and the celebration today. And there's been many hours put behind that. I, I, I can't mention them all. I'll probably forget someone in the, oh, but uh, Pastor Steve headed up a committee that had Tabitha Moore, uh, uh, Barb Colliner, Sarah Mays. Who else, did, Pastor Steve, did I miss? Tara Gilhood, Emily Ruffner, Savannah, Savannah Savannah, uh, Dowd. I got to get the right last name now that she's newly married. Uh, So thank you all for your work. Thanks for uh, many people helped along the way. And so I want to appreciate what you've done and and, uh, just express our appreciation for helping us to enjoy this this day. Uh, I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 14. And if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open there. Uh, One good thing about the tables, uh, hopefully if you've got a writing instrument or something, you can take some notes this morning. You'll notice if you pull out your program or your bulletin that there's some notes there. I've left some blanks in there for you to fill in as we work our way through. Uh, And we anticipate, and as we gather, uh, we, we gather on Sunday. And the reason why there's been 75 years of people gathering on Sunday is because Christ rose on Sunday, right? The reason why we gather, the reason why we meet is because we believe in a living, ruling, reigning, coming Savior, right? And He has spoken uh, to His people through His Word to guide and bless and uh, direct us and protect us until He comes. And even more so to keep us on mission because the King has come The king came, and we're going to read about the time of his coming. The king has come. He announced that he was the king. He demonstrated that he has every credential that we would look for in the king. He has power over life and death, power over heaven and hell, power over the natural world and the spiritual world. And he proved it ultimately, his depth of love on the cross when he went to the cross and took into himself everything that we had earned and took it onto himself so that we could know the freedom that we didn't deserve by his mercy and grace. And then he came alive from the grave to prove his deity, uh, not because he needed to, but because we needed to see it. And he left an empty tomb. Uh, And we now, by belief in Jesus, can enter the benefits of his death and be freed from the consequences of our sin because he died for our sake. And we can enter into his life and resurrection so that what threatens us and the reason why we can pray with hope and we can pray with purpose and meaning and not despair about Will and his mom today is because of the resurrection of Jesus. So that's why we gather today and every day. And that's why we want to pay attention to what Jesus has to say. And I want to talk to you today about a vision uh, for the next 75 years if the Lord tarries for Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I want to take us back to the Lord of the church, uh, to, his, uh, to the nature of our Lord, to the call of our Lord, and the type of life that he wants us to live as his people. I'm going to take us back to a very familiar passage the familiar passage of Peter walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14. But before we get there, I want to introduce and talk about a few things to set up what I want to say today about Jesus. You see the title, I've called it Get Out of the Boat, a vision for the EBC family on our 75th anniversary. Well, I'll take you to a a famous story and a fond story in Christian circles, the the books that constitute the Chronicles of Narnia. One of those little uh, novels is called Prince Caspian. It's one of the few that's been recently made into a uh, movie. Uh, But I want to take you to a particular scene from Prince Caspian. And it's one of my favorite scenes in all of the Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, this one is... Uh, not the scene that I've depicted there. That's Prince Caspian with Aslan, who is the lion, the figure of Jesus in the Chronicles of Narnia. 
Uh, but I want to take you to a scene where Susan uh, comes back into contact with Aslan, and it's a well-known one. And I want to read uh, this little uh, dialogue with you, and I've put the bulk of it here on the screen. But she sees Aslan, and she says, Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, sobbed Lucy at last. So she's missed him, she gets to see him again. The great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell, half sitting and half lying between his front paws. He bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all around her. She gazed into the large wise eyes and face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, he answered. Not because you are, Lucy said. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. In this famous episode, Lewis gets at one of the actual dynamics of following Jesus in the real world. For those who follow Jesus, our view of Jesus grows as we grow. When you follow Jesus, the one who is the fulfillment of not just Israel's, but humankind's deepest longings and hopes, he is not someone you grow beyond as if he is great for kids but loses his appeal for adults, like Santa. On the contrary, everything you need to make sense of life now and life to come is found through a relationship with Christ. A relationship with Christ is a never-ending journey of wonder and awe as you are transformed in the knowing. As one of Christ's most devoted followers, the Apostle Paul, told the Christ followers at Colossae, to know Christ is to know the one, and, and you just need to let this sink in, to know the one in whom are hidden all, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is why that same Paul described his Christian life as a yearning to know this Christ more and more so that he might come to truly see him for the wonder that he is. Now, many of you, oops, come back. I, I bumped forward too fast. Move me back one, Steve. I can't, there we go. All right. I remember the first time that I saw the Rocky Mountains on a driving trip. Some of you, how many of you have seen the Rocky Mountains? Have you been out there? I still remember it. I was traveling with a group of college students, uh, and the first time I saw them, they were 70 miles in the distance, right? And I was lulled into thinking, oh, we're right on top of them. Well, an hour and a half later, they actually were coming a little closer, right, in terms of the drive. So I remember the first time I saw them, and we were still over an hour and a half away with them by car, and they jutted up from the horizon as if they were a cutout range of purple construction paper mountains placed on a third grade decoupage. It looked like a simple line of mountains set next to each other, abruptly rising from the ground like an uneven wall. I remember how surprised I was at how long it actually took us to get to the mountains themselves. And when we did, we found out that miles of foothills lay in between us and the taller peaks. Not only that, we found that the peaks themselves were a jumble of shorter and taller peaks with valleys in between, with waterfalls spilling over the cliffs, with trees covering the lower slopes and snow on the upper reaches, with sheer rock walls and long, steep slopes, and so much more. They not only got bigger and bigger the closer we came, but they also got more and more interesting and awe-inspiring the closer we got. And as the mountains got bigger, the smaller I felt in the face of the vastness of the mountain landscape. They turned out to be the farthest thing from a flat cutout that you could imagine. But it's my experience with the mountains the same as my experience with Jesus. Are we at EBC getting closer to Jesus or is he merely the flannel graph figure of our childhood Sunday school that doesn't seem so interesting to the adult us? If we are getting closer, our Jesus should be getting bigger the older we get. Yet does he increasingly seem more powerful, more loving, and thus more trustworthy and more compelling than the other alternatives life has to offer for our fulfillment and security? Have we lost sight of Jesus as someone calling us into a closer and closer relationship with him that will change the way we think about him? 
about ourselves and about our neighbor. I say this, have we gotten bored with Jesus? Have we lost our vision of the grandeur, the power, and the love of God displayed and given through Jesus? Right? The ancient church, when they saw this, this loss of passion, they had a word for it. They called it the sin of sloth. And this is how they would define it. Sloth is a sluggishness of spirit, a sluggishness of feeling, of mind, and eventually body that grows from a state of dejection over the worthwhileness of spiritual things. As such, the sloth has no energy for anything spiritual that requires effort or sacrifice to experience its benefits. In particular, the sloth shrinks back from organizing their life toward Christ and against the currents of their fallen desires that are being stoked and encouraged by the world. Christ is not only not enough to satisfy their longings for purpose, meaning, and direction, but He is not even compelling enough to follow Him away from self and sin. Now, as we think about life together at EBC, on the occasion of our 75th anniversary, our call to follow Christ toward one another and out into the world on mission, has Jesus become a tame lion? Or maybe better, has He become a stuffed animal, a cute and cuddly reminder of simpler times, but wholly irrelevant to the demands of adult life? and something you would be ashamed of for anyone else to know that you have lying around on your bed at home? Have we domesticated Jesus so that He no longer compels our interest, no longer requires supernatural courage to follow Him, no longer is capable of sustaining our commitment to Him in the face of real adversity? Whether that be a struggle against our evil desires within or something brought about by attacks from opponents of Christ without. Well, we want to turn to one of those episodes and get reacquainted with Jesus. We want to see Him in His power, in His love. We want to see what His intentions are for His people and what He wants to do with us as His disciples. And I want to say this here, if you're here with us today and you haven't met this Jesus, I want you to meet Him. And I'm glad you're here today and I hope you get to see Him and all of His wonder and power. And this is the Christ that we serve. This is the reason why we're here. And for us that have been here for a while, we're not here about putting programs together. We're not here about paying off a mortgage. The mortgage is God's grace to us to utilize this facility to do His work, to love Him and follow Him, to bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ and to foster that in each other. So would you please stand with me? And I want to read from Matthew chapter 14. I want to read from the whole of our section, and I'll try to stay. Uh, with our text, and it's up on the screen. One of the most famous episodes from the life of Jesus. Uh, if you go out, one of the things you often find in the history of the church, most of the scenes of Jesus have been painted. I'm going to use one scene today. They've been painted. Interesting enough, this is one of the scenes that has been least painted in the history of the church for a number of reasons, and not really made as an altarpiece, uh, except for one exception here that we're going to look at. So let me read Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, to the end of the chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go out ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? 
And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now we know about the book of Matthew, and if you, you want to, uh, you can flip to the end of the book of Matthew. And one of the things about the book of Matthew, this is a manual for disciples. Uh, it is teaching the disciples, it's reacquainting the disciples with who Jesus is and what he has done uh, to recommission them on the mission that they've already received. And when you come to the end of the book of Matthew, it gives that commission, go into all the world and right, make disciples, right? And when you go, you baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and you teach them everything which I taught you. Well, the immediate referent, okay, well, Lord, what are we supposed to teach them? Well, I just gave you the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is what you're supposed to teach them. So go back through it and teach them what I taught you, right, so that they can follow me as for who I am on the mission that I have sent them on. So I want to look at what this teaches us about Jesus and about what his intentions are for his disciples, how he deals with us as his followers, and what he beckons us to, okay? So as we walk our way through, here's the first thing that I want to talk about here. As I want to say that Jesus is intentional about growing his disciples. Now, I, want to, I just want to emphasize here that, that you believe that Jesus is actively pursuing you as a follower of Jesus. He wants you to grow. The Christian life is not a static life. It's a dynamic life, right? The change that he wants to make in you is so deep, so profound, so thoroughgoing, right, that you don't even have an idea of how rich and good it is. As a matter of fact, the, de the destination he wants to take you on because you're broken still and you're still growing, you can't even see that the destination he's taken you looks good right now because you're comfortable with the life that you have, right? One of the other famous metaphors that C.S. Lewis, the writer of, of the Caspian uh, novel here, uh, is the one who says we're, we're content often with playing with mud pies and mud puddles because we have no conception of what a holiday at the sea would look like. And we as believers, we're tit we, we fiddle around on the edges of commitment to Jesus because what he calls us to seems too radical, seems too crazy, seems too out of bounds. It seems so unusual, meaning I have to live this way and forgive these kinds of people and trust you to walk this way. And so, but Jesus is intentional about taking you to, to the life. You've been brought up to life by virtue of believing in him. Now he wants to take you into it fully. And Jesus himself said this in John chapter 10, verse 10. I've come that you might have life and have it to the full, right? An abundant life. That's what he wants for us. So you're not in a static position. If you think that Jesus is done with you, you've lost sight of Jesus. And he's still at work, even if you're trying to ignore his attention. Sometimes he has to use adversity as a megaphone to get our attention. But here we are. He's intentional. So Jesus, notice verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And then after he dismissed them, right, this is the interesting thing. Okay, guys, take off. They're in the boat. Jesus stays on the shore, right? I don't know if they had a conversation like, Jesus, how are you going to get where we're going? So he's, he's launching them off. He's staying on the shore. He goes up to a mountainside by himself to pray. Well, that's un not unusual for Jesus. He does everything in conversation with the Father all the time. But he lets them get a, get a good distance from the shore, right? He lets them get, if you want to look at this way, he gets them way beyond places where you could wade to the boat that they're in. They're out in deep water. He lets them get way out. And so it says here, verse 24, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, and now he sends them out. Not only does Jesus send them out distant from the land, but he sends them out in a storm. It's buffeted by the waves, and the wind was against them. So here they are, right, and this, nobody's cranking up, you know, the Evan Rood on the back, right, <clears throat> you know, and they're moving across, right, they, what, they got a sail, and they've got a rudder in the back. They may have some oars that they're using. So they're out there struggling, right, to get the thing going where they need to go. 
So Matthew sets the scene by emphasizing that the whole event was orchestrated by Jesus. Jesus sends the crowds away, and he sends them out of our view. So Matthew says, I want you to look at Jesus and the disciples, and I want you to think about the crowds. I want you to think right about them. So Jesus sends his disciples on ahead of him with the intention to connect with them. He goes off alone to pray, and he talks to God. He's going to set up a very, very crucial moment for his disciples. And while he prays, the disciples succeed in making progress, although they're rowing into stiff headwinds. So Jesus sets up this scenario so that, and this is the cr crazy thing, why, why would Jesus do this? Why would he send them out there so that he could walk to them on water? Well, what it makes it very clear is Jesus is doing that to reveal his glory to them. He wants them to see him for who he is. He wants them to reckon with it. And these are Jewish men. He wants them to recognize because everything that they know of Scripture and everything that they know, that the one who's in control of the seas, that often represent chaos and threat, the one who's in control of the seas is Yahweh, it's God. God's in control of the seas. So he wants them to see that he is not controlled by the elements. The elements are controlled by him. Water serves just as well as land for a nighttime stroll. And I can walk across the land or I can walk across the mud. It doesn't make any difference because the elements serve me. I don't serve them. The elements serve his purposes, not he theirs. Walking on the waters and calming the storms are prerogatives of God alone. And I want to read you. If you want to write this down in your notes. Psalm 107, verses 23 to 32. Psalm 107, right? Throughout the scriptures, God is the God of the sea. He's the God of the depths. So here's what it says in verse 23 of Psalm 107. Some went out on sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest and lifted the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. So Jesus sets up this moment intentionally because he wants the disciples to see him. The second thing then, as we come here, Steve, you can move me forward, right? Oops, I got carried away. Jesus lovingly but dramatically reveals his glory, his divinity to them. Now look in verse 25 of our text. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Right now here... This, we have to sit here as, as, as 21st century people here, right? And this is not, this is something very different than the Chronicles of Narnia because you could never go visit Narnia. There is no talking lion to go visit and talk to. You can't meet Susan or any of the other characters as much as you'd like to. But every one of these people that are speaking here are real people in a real situation with real water and real earth and Jesus is walking on water. That's what we have to say. This is not, you know, they, Peter was smoking a bad weed and had a vision, right? That's not what's going on here, right? This, these, these guys are alert. And matter of fact, they're, they're on their wits end, almost like the psalm in Psalm 107, because they're in a life-threatening situation. They're struggling to survive, right? They don't have any experience, you and I. They don't believe in ghosts any more than you and I do as 21st century people. They didn't immediately recognize, say, oh, that's obviously Jesus, and he's the son of God. No, they responded to him, and they were freaked out. Jesus sets this up. And so, in verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. So Jesus prays for most of the night, lets them get a distance, and then he just walks out on the choppy seas. He just walks out on them. 
When they saw him, they were freaked out, thought it was a ghost. Then verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's me. Take courage, it's me. Jesus is not showing off or doing something odd to give a little wow factor to their lives. That's not what he's doing. Jesus is trying to show them who he is so that they might come more fully into the life he wants them to know. The life they were created for, and now he wants to redeem them to know. And what you want to see at the center of this story is getting Jesus right is the key to everything. He's the key to everything. Now, third thing we want to pick up from the story. Jesus encourages the disciples to experience the crazy life a relationship with him offers, right? Now, when I say a crazy life, I mean a crazy life from the perspective of the world in which we live, right? If you're going to live out what Scripture calls you to do as a husband and a wife in marriage, you are crazy in our contemporary culture. If you're going to be a man or a woman who's going to keep your sexual desires within the bounds that God has prescribed for them as your creator, you're going to be viewed as a prude, as a crazy person, even a bigot. If you're going to love across ethnic lines, if you're going to love across socioeconomic lines, if you're going to love generously all of people as in image bearers of God, equally worthy of love and time and energy, you're going to look odd against a culture that wants to reduce people to the color of their skin or to the level of their income or to the, the attractiveness of their bodies. And so the life that he's beckoning us to is a life against the grain of a world in rebellion against God. It's a life against the grain of the darkness that's still residual in your own soul. The fundamental desire that each of us have is we want to be elevated. We want to be applauded. We want to be served. We want to be liked. We want people to appreciate us. The life of taking the lesser for ourselves so that others can have God's best is something that's supernatural. 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 And so he reveals his glory because he wants to invite us into this crazy life. So look at verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus doesn't say, oh, Peter, you're an idiot. Stay in the boat, right? Peter, I don't want you, you're not, you're not, I don't want you to experience this life. Peter, you know, come on. Peter, you're always, you know, asking for stuff. You're a big whiner, right? Uh, I know what's going to happen to you, Peter. You're going to step out and then you'll screw it up, Peter. That's what you do every time right? Well, Jesus doesn't say any of those kind of things. He says, come. Come on, Peter, come. So Peter responds like he does. However, he only speaks for himself. So he stopped panicking at least. He's seeing Jesus. And in turn, Jesus says, well, well, come on. He invites him, right? Then we know what happens, right? The famous story, verse, right at the end of verse 29. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? So at Jesus' invitation, Peter hops out of the boat, makes his way toward Jesus on the wind-blown choppy seas. However, when he's fixed his attention on the stormy water, his faith wavered. His belief that he could do what Jesus had invited him to do evaporated. I've been asking myself, do I believe that I can do what Jesus invites me to do. He does doubt. He does doubt Jesus, though indirectly. In that moment, he failed to connect what Jesus had done in coming to him walking on the sea with what he was doing by Jesus' invitation. The Jesus who walks on the water can sustain me to walk with him. The wind-blown, angry seas made him doubt the wisdom of his actions because his vision of Jesus had not grown so as to encompass a walking-on-the-water Jesus. What he found is that the only way he could do what Jesus invited him to do was to do it trusting in the power of a bigger Jesus than he had come to accept up until that point. What kind of Jesus do you need to open your mouth and identify with Jesus at your workplace? What kind of Jesus do you need to open your mouth and identify with Jesus in your school? 
What kind of Jesus do you need to let him come right into and reorient your, your dating life? What kind of Jesus do you need to come in and give you courage to walk with Jesus in the face of those who are walking away from him? What kind of Jesus do you need? You have a Jesus who walks on the water, and he's the one that says, come walk with me. So there's a whole bunch of things that this, this, uh, this episode reveals, and I want to talk with you about them. All right? So, oops, I'm going way ahead. I'm back. All right, let me pick them up. You guys, I, I exposed it. Take me back one. There we go. It's probably going to go again. Now, I've exposed something I didn't want to do. They were supposed to all be clicked up individually. Now they're all up. That means if you're a, 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 a blank filler, you're all filling blanks right now. So has everybody got all their blanks filled? All right, good. All right, now let me, let me talk about them, right, so that you can see them, okay? So I don't know what happened there, but something got goofed up. All right, first one. Right, right at the top, Jesus welcomes our desire to experience his power working in and through us. He beckons us on in a grander, more realistic view of who he is and of our potential as his followers. You know, one of the things that, that many people have talked about in, in the uh, aftermath of COVID, right, one of the things that happened in COVID is that safety became everyone's primary concern. Right, and we talked about that here at Emmanuel. For a follower of Jesus, safety is not the primary concern Faithfulness is the primary concern. Am I following Jesus? Am I trusting him? Christians from the very beginning, from the earliest disciples, were people who went out and lived boldly for Jesus. And for all of the disciples, maybe except for one, it cost them their life. All of them were martyred, maybe except for John. So it was never about safety first. It was about faithfulness first because undergirding the everyday life of a Christian, no matter what the circumstances, is that you were ultimately safe. You were ultimately safe. Because why? Everything that truly threatens you had been removed. And what was that? The wrath of God. Well, who took care of that? Jesus. What was the punishment for the wrath of God that you justly deserved? It was the wages of sin is death. Well, who took care of that? Jesus. All the rest of it is, well, I don't know how it's all going to wrap up, but I know what the end of the story is. And we triumph. Thanks be to God who causes us to triumph in Christ. So the Christians were always moving out in life in ways that, that the, the secular world said, that doesn't make sense to me. You should be protecting your life. You're hazarding your life by caring for those people that are sick. There's a, there's a reason why in the history of the church over time, why there's so many hospitals and hospitals got generated in different places in the world that they had Christian names on them. Because they were Christians going into places like we have in Togo today where people are facing disease and deprivation, right? Not with the ultimate hope of medicine, but they're going because their ultimate hope is put in Christ and they're caring for people who could threaten their very own life. Why? Because they want to bring them the hope of Jesus and they want their love through medicine to, to remind them of who Jesus is and what Jesus does in people and that Jesus loves them and cares for them. Well, that's in the history of what we're doing. So he welcomes a desire for us, right, to experience his power working through us. And he wants to use us in those ways. And then second here, Jesus enables what he invites us to do. He calls us to follow him into a life of trusting obedience, a journey that will transform us and enable us to experience his transforming work. I, by God's grace, a vision for Emmanuel, I hope by God's grace that through our missionaries, through us in our neighborhoods, through us at our workplace, may God proclaim the name of Jesus to the salvation of many. May he do that. May we be yearning for that. May it be a part of our prayers. May we be dissatisfied in ourselves if we don't see people hearing about Jesus, if we're not thinking about how to bring Jesus to people, if, if our missionaries don't feel supported in their work. One of the things that's so sweet about God's faithfulness to us as a, a church is that over the years, by God's grace, when we took a commitment on for a missionary, we have not, by God's grace, ever defaulted on that commitment. I'm so thankful for that. I want our missionaries to know that if we're partnering together with them in a foreign land where they're essentially living out their Christian life in just a different culture, that they can know that the people behind them are faithfully supporting them. 
Then thirdly, Jesus enables only in the context of explicit, ongoing dependence, right? So this is a key idea. To take our eyes off of Jesus is to disconnect from his enablement. The obstacles are too big for us. He has to be our reference point if we're going to have the power to sustain us and if we are to know the direction we need to go. Jesus is not someone, and God forgive us, if we ever reduce Jesus to the emergency pull cord. Like we just put Jesus on a shelf over there and say, Jesus, I don't want you to mess with my dating life. I don't want you to mess with my pocketbook. I don't want really to, to get on me about the way I'm speaking to my wife. I don't want you to pay attention to what I'm doing on my computer. I don't really want you to care about how I view my job. I don't want you to mess with that. But Jesus, when things get bad, you better be there when I pull that cord to come off. Jesus said, I love you too much to live that way. You may ignore me, but I'm not going to ignore you. And I'm going to bring every bit of pressure down on your life to turn you face up toward me. And so Jesus says you need to live a life, and in the, in the idea of depending on him, we need to constantly be reminded, who do you serve today? Who are you speaking to when you pray? This is the Lord of the universe. This is the coming judge of the living and the dead. This is the ruling, reigning Christ. This is the resurrected Jesus. That's who we serve. That's who we serve. So today he's worth it. Right? Today he's worth saying no to sin. Today I can trust him to walk with him. He knows what he's talking about. He's the only one that's come out on the other side of death. All the other people don't know what they're talking about. So he's worthy, right? And then fourthly, Jesus didn't calm the seas, but he enabled Peter to come to him through the stormy seas. And I can look out over this crowd. There are people who are in the stormy seas right now, emotionally, relationally, physically, Jesus doesn't come in to Peter and say, wait, wait, I know Peter, it's a little scary. Here, hey, all right, calm everything down. Mm. All right, now Peter, walk out. And then Jesus didn't throw him a floaty either. All right, Peter, put these on your arms, right? And do it. No, he didn't do any of that. The, it's, the storm is still raging. He said, come, come. I'll enable you to come to me through the storm. Lynn's here, she's in a storm. Rhonda's here, and she's been in a pain storm for a long time. We've got other people. Will is in a storm today. Debbie's in a storm today. That's life in a fallen world. What we've talked about, I was talking with Galen just last night. Sometimes at the same moment as the people of God, we're rejoicing as we are today. Right? One of the joys of my life that I'm rejoicing in, I'm thankful to God for, was a good dad. I'm thankful for him. I miss him today. I'm thankful for that. But on the same time, I'm grieving with Will. That's, that's life in a fallen world. One day we won't have that, that, that crazy balance to try to work out. We'll just be rejoicing. I will just be rejoicing. But the issue here is Jesus doesn't stop the storm. He just says, come to me in the storm. I can sustain you. And this is the other thing where we get the idea, God, I know best. And God, if you would just stop the storm, then I could be faithful. If you would just stop the storm, then I, could, then I could testify to you. If you just stop the storm, then everything good. And Jesus said, no, no, I need you to know that I'm bigger than the storm. You can be faithful to me in the storm. And he takes us back to a Jesus who walks on water. And then finally, the last one here, though Peter lost faith, this is so encouraging to me, right? Though Peter lost faith, Jesus still saved him. His faithfulness overcame his unfaithfulness. Jesus did not reject him, abandon him, berate him, or even treat him as an irritation. How often has Jesus saved us when what he is saving us from is a danger brought about by our lack of trust in him? Why was Peter going to drown? Because he stopped trusting Jesus. And when you get into a storm and a difficulty, in a marriage, in a family, in a relationship, financially, the evil one's going to say, well, you better abandon Jesus right now. That ain't going to work. I know he's told you to do this. That ain't going to work. I know he's told you to forgive people. But that ain't going to work. You need to just, you need to nurse that anger and let that vengeance get white hot. 
what faith-deepening adventures have we missed because we're comfortable where we are? Or because we think that God could not empower us to do such a thing? Or because we're afraid? Or because we're bored? Or because we are... What adventures were short-circuited because we lost our nerve when we made the challenges bigger than Jesus? What happened? What can God do through Emmanuel Baptist Church in the city of Xenia? What can God do in the lives of the men and women here, in the lives of the people that we touch? What can God do in Togo? What can God do in France? What can God do in the various places that God allows us to invest in? What can he do? So, finally here, Jesus' training leads to worship. One of the things that you find is you look at the, the notes here, verse 32, and when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him. Right? How do you know that you're growing in Christ? It's Christ is more powerful, more awe-inspiring, more worthy of worship. Uh, you would be m more and more reluctant not to give him attention in a given day. You'd be more and more reluctant to just step out on your own. You want, when you get into a time of difficulty and confusion, you need some wisdom. Well, what do you want? You want the people who know Jesus the best in your life to give you some advice when life seems overwhelming. What do you want to do when, something, when life is dark? You want people to come around you and call down to heaven, right, for wisdom and strength and to, to hold on to him and be faithful to him because that's the only way through the storm. What do you want when life is going really well, which for many of us as Christians, that's the most dangerous moment in our life. When we're succeeding, then we forget that we're dependent upon God. We forget that the, 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 the resources and talents that we have are all on loan from him. We forget that he's the one that raises up and sets down, and all of a sudden we start puffing up our chests. Well, we need the people of God to step in and say, hey, Greg, you're not so great. We need that from the people of God, to be tethered to Jesus. So here, will we accept, as the people of God, will we accept Jesus' invitation to step out of the boat, even the good paths we're on, Right? And I'm going to say this real clearly. I'm not calling many of you uh, the good paths that you're on. Some of you are on very good paths, right? Well-worn paths, right? This is one of the, the, you know, I'm the old person now. I'm in the old person crowd. And what's one of the stereotypical truths about old people, right? It's, it comes up in, in, in little quips like this. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? They're set in their ways, Right, man? Okay. And sometimes when you talk about an old Christian, right, it's like, why? Well, it seems like we can't teach this old dog any new tricks. That's not the dynamic of the Christian life. I don't care if you're 25 or 55 or 95, your path toward Jesus is as big and as grand and as full of adventure as it's ever been. Because he is the goal of it. Right? If you think that you've grown enough, well, then you've lost sight of Jesus. If you're bored, you've lost sight of Jesus. If you're wandering off to something else, there is no green grass on the other side. And so all those kind of things, when you come to this, are we going to accept that? And I want the years ahead not to be the best days are not in the past. Right? That's not true biblically, nor should it be for us personally. Right? As great as the cross is and the resurrection, we look back to and count on those, the reason why they're, they're less of them because the consummation waits. The best days are yet to come. Right? So we don't live in the past. We don't yearn for the good old days. We look forward to Jesus who always makes us want to press. So I want to reinvigorate us. So let me just give you some ideas. Will we, and as I conclude, will we get out of the boat of having Bibles around or of opening them on Sundays and get into the faith-building waters of reading them to obey them on a regular basis. To read them to do. Will we get out of the boat of tithing into the faith-building waters of rich generosity and kingdom investing? Will we organize our lives to live with less so others can see and hear more about Jesus? Third, will we get out of the boat of mere respectability or niceness 
right? There's one of those things that's really uh, popular among little kids right now is the phrase, you know, let's all be kind, right? When I, I like that phrase. I like it to be kind. I don't want people to be nasty or rude, right? But that's not enough for life, right, about in terms of kindness. But will we, we move beyond the boat of mere respectability or niceness into the faith-building waters of open witness for Jesus to our friends and neighbors, Right? Every one of us knows the lump in our throat that comes when you open your mouth and you declare that you're a follower of Jesus. Number one, if you're in your group of friends, then all of a sudden they want to say, well, let's see if there's anything different about him. And then they're going to jump on you when you're inconsistent with it. And you've got to decide, well, how does a, per, a follower of Jesus who isn't perfect, who's going to fail, how do you handle your failures? What do you do with them? Do you blame everybody else the way our culture does? Or do you accept responsibility for what you've done? Every time you come to a Father's Day or a Mother's Day, it is full of people who are thinking, the reason why my life is so screwed up, it's all my dad's fault. The reason why I'm screwed up, it's my mom's fault. And you'll never know life until you come to the point where you say, no, I've got to decide what I have to do with my life. And this may have happened in my past. It shapes who I am. But by the grace of God, that doesn't determine who I am. And that doesn't give me an excuse to behave badly. And it doesn't give me a, an excuse to, to, uh, to crap on other people's lives that God may bless with someone or to be envious or angry at them because God has redeemed me to the, the uttermost. He's given me everything that I long for and he wants to take me on an adventure that I can't imagine. That's the God that we have. And so we want to get out of mere respectability, mere niceness to open witness. Get out of the boat of begrudging service or mere duty into the faith-building waters of thankful, trusting, committed service to Christ. You know, I, I, I reflected with my wife about this this week. The, the service to Jesus for the follower of Jesus is its own reward. Service to Jesus for the follower of Jesus is its own reward because the reward is the delight of Jesus. And to know that as you serve him, in the process of serving him, he's bringing you to life. The end of serving Jesus is not the thanks of the people of Jesus or of other people. It's the delight in the heart of Jesus. Will we get out of the boat of mere church attendance or faith-building waters of pursuing and opening ourselves up to others in order to know and serve them? Will we get out of the boat of formal conversation with Jesus around meals into the faith-building waters of a prayer closet that you frequent often and in which you tarry long? Now, I know I'm calling you some. Every one of us knows who's followed Jesus Christ. The first time you try to deepen and lengthen your prayer life, you want to talk about a spiritual battle that you'll be in, you better get ready. You're going to have to persevere. Because the evil one does not want you to have a conversation with the Father. He does not want you to orient your life that way. Will we get out of the boat of, and here I want you to listen to me about this one. Will we get out of the boat, I'll give Jesus' way a trial for a while to see if it gets me what I want and into the faith-building waters of following his way with a no-turning-back commitment, a commitment to his way of selfless, unconditional love in your marriage, in your family, at your job, at your school. Jesus will withstand any pressure that our lives put on him. It's an affront to him to say, I'm going to give you a try, Jesus, to see if you come through. Will we get out of the boat of no open hostility and into faith-building waters of reconciliation of moving beyond an absence of conflict toward a place of restoration? Now, I just say to you, put in your own. Get out of the boat of, into the faith-building waters of, I don't know what it is. You fill in the blank. What does Jesus want us to see about him? Where is he t asking us to step out of the boat? Will we step out or will we stay in? What are we going to do? As long as Christ tarries, may Jesus never become a tame lion at EBC. 
as long as Jesus tarries. May we be enthralled by him, in awe of him, delighted and privileged to serve him. May we talk to him, talk of him. May we praise him, celebrate him, declare him to other people. By God's grace, may we be faithful until he comes. A vision for us at EBC is Jesus. May God help us.